please turn to uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21. Uh, Matthew chapter 21. If you'll find that and mark it, we'll begin there uh, here shortly. As you're turning there, I want to ask you this uh, question. Maybe, maybe you've gotten this uh, comment before. Has anybody ever said to you, you know, that's a different side to you? That's a, a different side to you than I, I really wasn't expecting. For those of us that are more reserved, it may have been that uh, we got in a different setting and, and they saw that maybe we were more funny or, or more engaging uh, than they expected, right? That we had a personality. Being re- more reserved myself, I've sometimes received those comments. For those that are more outspoken, you're, you're kind of the life of the party typically. Maybe you were in a, a different environment and you were much quieter. And somebody said, you know, you're just much quieter and kind of kept to yourself. I, I didn't expect that of you. But I have noticed this comment uh, comes up more often when we see somebody get angry or upset, right? Maybe somebody sees us get angry or upset or, or we witness it from somebody else and we go, you know, that really caught me off guard. Sometimes it's followed with, I liked it. Had a little passion to it. Other times, you, you kind of scared me. I don't know what I think of that. And I mentioned that this morning because as we continue to work our way through the gospel of Matthew, looking at these different events in the life of Jesus, uh, we come to this passage in chapter 21 where we do see this different side to Jesus. Because in verses 12 to 22, we find Jesus get angry. And he clears out this temple. He begins to overturn table. He's, he's body slamming people. Maybe not that. He didn't do that. But he did overturn tables. He did drive people out of the temple. And he is upset. I mean, he is ticked off. And then we read after he clears the temple, he actually does a little bit of teaching, we're told in the Gospel of Mark. But then he leaves And he curses a fig tree, and it's like, what is happening? And we see all these different sides to Jesus. Now, one of the things that I've enjoyed as we've worked our way through the Gospel of Matthew, maybe you've been doing the reading of a chapter each day, is is to see the different sides to who Christ Jesus is. His different emotions, his different responses, and when he finds himself in these various situations. But what is so amazing as we see his love and his grace, we see his anger, his frustration, his tenderness, his compassion, just this beautiful picture of who Jesus is. What is so amazing to me is he always had the right emotion at the right time. He always responded the right way. I mean, think about that. He he responds in all these different ways, but yet he is still without sin. And so this passage this morning may show you a different side to Jesus that you're expecting. But it's a very intriguing picture of who Jesus is. Because again, we see him get angry. But we also find his amazing compassion, his amazing tenderness. Now, as we get to chapter 21, we we need to get a little bit of the setting, the context of what is taking place. Uh, Chapter 21, what takes place is that Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem, what's known as the triumphal entry. It's also known as Palm Sunday. And so he he rides in on this uh, donkey and, and the people begin to celebrate. The city of Jerusalem at this time is what is known as the Passover celebration. Hundreds of thousands of people are there. Jesus has been teaching and doing miracles for almost three years now. And there is this excitement building up that maybe he is the Messiah. And as he enters the city walls, people begin to cheer and they lay these palm branches down. It's, it's red, that kind of like laying out the red carpet for Jesus. And they cry out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I mean, they are so excited. And in Matthew chapter 21, verse 10, uh, the city of Jerusalem is in this uproar and the people are asking this question, who is this? Now we may wonder as Jesus enters the city, what will be his first act? What what will he he begin with? The people wanted him to go to the Romans and, and, and start this revolution, take his place on the throne. But instead, Jesus, he doesn't do any of the things that they're expecting. He first goes to the temple. 
And so what we're going to do this morning, we're going to look at this account where Jesus clears the temple, work our way through that, and then we're going to go to this account where Jesus curses this fig tree, okay? So kind of part one and part two. Well, if you have Matthew chapter 21, if you'll look with me at verses 12 to 17. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Now, when it comes to the temple, it's a little bit hard for us uh, to grasp uh, the importance of the temple because everything in Jewish life centered around the temple. So, for example, religiously, the temple represented where God dwelt with his people. But the temple is also where sacrifices were offered. In the civic arena, if you will, of life, they would pay a temple tax. So part of their taxes went to support the upkeep of the temple. Uh, Medically, and this may sound strange, but medically, uh, you had to go to the priest. So if you would have like a certain skin condition, you would go to the priest and have to show that to them. And they would make a determination, are you ceremonially clean or unclean? This is why Jesus, sometimes when he would heal somebody, he would say, go show yourself to the priests. And then also just kind of the the community aspect of the temple. This is where people went to meet. Even the early church in the book of Acts, we find the early Christians going to the temple to meet with each other and to worship God. And so everything surrounded the temple. Now, if you look at the screen, you get a little bit of an idea of what this temple area looked like. And so in our passage, it talks about the temple. What it means is the temple mount. So the city of Jerusalem is, is on this kind of mountain in the, in the temple here. This temple mount is at the high point. Now, it was a big area. It was about 500 yards uh, long, 330 yards wide. And so, you know, a football field 100 yards. And so that kind of gives you a, a visual of how big this area was. Now, if you notice over on the left side, you see that big space that says the court of uh, the Gentiles. And so the Temple Mount, it had all these different courts. So in the actual temple, you had the, the Holy of Holies that could only be entered once a year by the high priest. And then you went out from that and it was an area inside the temple building where the priest could go. But then as you left the building, there was a court for Jewish men and then Jewish women and then this court for the Gentiles, so non-Jewish people but also anybody that had some type of physical ailment, some some issues such you couldn't see or you you could not walk. This is where you went uh, to worship and pray uh, to the Lord. And it's in this court of the Gentiles, kind of close to that building that has the red roof in a corner section there, where all this begins to take place, where the commerce is happening, where Jesus begins to flip tables and, and all the rest. Now, we need to ask the question, why does Jesus get so angry? And there's a couple of factors that we need to understand. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, uh, a couple of days from then, it would be what is called the Passover celebration. You know, for us, Easter is the high point of our religious calendar. For them, it was Passover. And so lots of people, really hundreds of thousands of people would come to Jerusalem and offer a sacrifice at the temple. Now, the sacrifice, it could be a goat or a lamb. If you were poor, it could be a pigeon or a dove. And what would happen is people would travel long distances to get to Jerusalem and get to the temple. And, and the animal that they offered had to be a, like a lamb, for example, with no blemish, meaning nothing was wrong with it. So, you know, if it had maybe a little piece of its ear that was missing or maybe part of its hoof or whatever it may be, if you presented this to the priest for your sacrifice, it would get rejected. And as you can imagine, traveling over long distances, uh, maybe the lamb would get injured 
or maybe it would uh, possibly die. And so you bought this animal in anticipation of showing it to the priest and something could happen on the way, or maybe you get there and it's rejected. And so over time, uh, to help avoid this issue, a service developed where you don't have to travel with your animal. We've got you taken care of. When you show up in the city of Jerusalem, we have the animal for you. As you can imagine, the prices began to increase. It's kind of like going to the movie, right? Anybody want to see Dune 2? I'm excited to see that. But we know we're going to buy our ticket. If we want popcorn and, and soda and all the rest, they're, they're bumping those prices up. Now, I try to get back at them a little bit. You know, like a two-hour movie like that, I might drink three sodas and two tubs of popcorn and think I get back at them, but then I'm miserable the rest of the day. So they, they still get me. So we've been to the movie. We've been to the airport. They, they bump up those prices. We, we need food. We need something. And so they increase it. And this is what is taking place here. But that's not the only issue. You had to have the right currency at the temple. So your coinage, your currency that you used outside of the temple would not work. And so when you get to the temple, you had to exchange it. And once again, there's a fee. So you're paying more for your animal. You're paying to exchange the currency. And this is why Jesus is getting so upset and he calls it a den of robbers. But it's not just what is taking place that makes Jesus angry. It's where it's taking place. See, where it is taking place is this court of the Gentiles. And just kind of imagine the scene. There are thousands of people in this area. There are thousands of animals. And people and animals are loud. We know what animals do after they eat, right? And so it is just a mess. And this court of the Gentiles, this is where the non-Jewish people and and those with physical issues, where they were to gather for worship and prayer. And Jesus looks around and he sees all this, all the extortion taking place. Just the the mess that this is and how the the Gentiles cannot worship. This is why he says the temple, my house is a house of prayer. Jesus is taking this from the Old Testament book of Isaiah in chapter 56. And when you look at the context of that chapter, it says that God's house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. So the Jewish people, they were to be a light to the nations. The way they worship God, the environment they, they <clears throat> excuse me, created, uh, especially at the temple, was to be this light for the Gentiles. That it was attractive. That the way that they worship pointed people to the one true and living God. But instead, there was no concern for those that were far from the Lord. Those that had these physical needs, there was no concern for them. And Jesus sees all this, and he is grieved and angry, and he begins to clear it out. He removes any barrier for people that could not come to God. And when Jesus does this, of removing these barriers, of putting the focus back on God, what happens? It's beautiful. In verses 14 and 15, it says, those that are, that are blind and, and lame, they came to Jesus and they were healed. Children begin to praise Jesus. This is what is supposed to be happening at the temple, but there were all these barriers, all this stuff in the way. And when Jesus clears this out, this is when they can worship. This is when he can show his gentleness and his tenderness and compassion to them. I think before we move on, though, we have to kind of ask ourselves the hard question in our own lives. Is there anything in your life right now that you need to overturn? See, physically, Jesus is overturning the tables and all the rest, but but spiritually, we can apply this to our own life. Is there anything in our life that needs to be overturned so we can worship God? Is there anything in our life that needs to be overturned that's a barrier to other people worshiping the Lord? Is it a certain sin? Is it an attitude? Maybe it's bitterness or or unforgiveness. Could it be a a relationship that is fractured, maybe with a family member or an ex-friend? Do you need to go to them and apologize? Maybe, Maybe try and reconcile that. And you may not be able to reconcile, but at least you need to go to them. Because at this point, if you would invite them to church or have a conversation about Christ, they would reject it. And so Jesus... 
He overturns the tables. He, he shows anger. But this was not so he would stay angry. It was so that he could show compassion to people, so that they could worship and praise the Lord. So that's part one. Now, as we move to part two, we find Jesus curse a fig tree. So look with me, if you will, at verse 18. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Verse 21, Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now, what's going on here, right? <laughs> I mean, we read this, it's kind of a bizarre scene. And if you go to the gospel of Mark, it gets even more odd because in the gospel of Mark, uh, Mark makes this comment that it wasn't even fig season. I mean, so why, why is Jesus so upset? Why does he curse this fig tree? I mean, is he just having a bad day? You know, an off moment? You know, he's got the religious leaders and all these people and all this pressure. You know, Jesus doesn't have a dog to kick. He's already returned the donkey. And so he can't, you know, deal with it. So he just curses this tree. That's how we might respond, right? Did you have that this week? Maybe somebody criticized you at work. Maybe everybody was wanting something from you. Maybe you did something for your, your kids and they didn't respond in the way that you want. Maybe kids, you did something that you thought your parents should notice and they didn't. What do we do? We get mad. We have this outburst, right? But though Jesus curses this fig tree, and it may seem odd, and even critics of Jesus in the Bible, they point to this scene and they say, man, Jesus, you messed up. This is weird. Like, oh, why are you acting like this? There's a few things that we need to understand of what is really taking place here. First of all, we need to understand a little bit of how the fig tree works, all right? So this is gardening with Jason, and it'll take just a, a few moments. All right, so I did a lot of extensive research this week. So the fig tree, it is ready for figs in the summer. So just like kind of any fruit tree, it takes a while. And so there's no leaves, and then leaves finally begin to show up around springtime. And this is the time that Jesus curses this tree. Now, fig trees, what they would produce is called uh, pragum. Okay, it's the small edible uh, green bud. And so when the leaves would begin to show up, yes, there wasn't figs yet, and Jesus knew there wasn't figs, but yet there should be this pagum that he could eat. And so he goes up to this tree, and, and he looks around, and he sees all these leaves, but there's nothing there. There's, there's no pragum to eat. And what this means is that with this particular tree that had leaves on it, but didn't have this pragum, that it was a diseased tree, and that this tree would never bear any figs. This tree was good for nothing. But that's not all. Jesus, and we sometimes miss this because we, we highlight he's our king and our savior, which obviously he is, but he was also a prophet. And he said and did stuff like an Old, pro Old Testament prophet would do. And so Old Testament prophets, not only would they proclaim and, and say God's word, but oftentimes they would, they would act it out. They would do some type of what's called a sign act or an object lesson. So take Isaiah, for example. Isaiah had this very hard message that he was had to tell the people of Israel that they would go into exile because of their unfaithfulness to God. And so it was a hard message, and he had to proclaim that for three years. But what made it more difficult is he had to do this naked. And I'm not making that up. Now, some scholars think maybe he had a loincloth. Others are not so sure. And so he would, he would proclaim all this naked in front of the people. Now, why would God make him do that? It's because the Lord was saying, you've been unfaithful. I've been gracious. I've been calling you back. You won't come back to me. You're going to go into exile and you're going to do so in shame and you're going to do so actually physically naked. The prophet Hosea, he was told by God to marry a prostitute who would be unfaithful uh, to Hosea. Her name was Gomer. 
Bad name, bad lady, right? You got to be careful of that. And so Hosea, he was told to do this. Why? It was this object lesson that his wife was unfaithful. And this is how the relationship between God and Israel was. One of the ways that it's described is that of a marriage. But the people of Israel, they committed adultery against God. And so this very extreme object lesson took place with Hosea. Ezekiel, he did some really strange uh, stuff, and I won't get into all of it, but one of them, he would <clears throat> lie on his side for 390 days straight. Now, I don't think it was for uh, 24 hours a day, but he would go into the crowded area. He would lay on his side for 390 straight days. And the reason that he was doing this is because for 390 years, the people of Israel had sinned and been unfaithful. And so again, they would not only proclaim, but they would do these object lessons. And I have to say, I hope God doesn't come to me next week and say, hey, I got a sermon illustration for you. All right, I'm a little nervous about this one. You did not want to be an Old Testament prophet. It's a hard message. You had to do these object lessons. And then your reward often was to be killed. And so Jesus, as a prophet, he does this object lesson. And in the Old Testament, the fig tree symbolized the nation of Israel. And the object lesson is this. The nation of Israel, like this fig tree, appeared to be showing fruit, but there was no fruit. This is why the story of the fig tree is so close to this temple clearing. The nation of Israel, there was lots of activity, but no substance. There appeared to be religion, but there was no true religion. On the outside, it looked good, but their hearts were not being changed. There was no concern for those far from God. There was no concern for those in need. There was hypocrisy. Lots of activity. No substance. Like the fig tree, there appeared to be fruit, but no fruit. And again, I think we have to do the hard work of applying this to our lives. I know none of us is perfect. I know we all still sin, but yet is there hypocrisy in our life where we're saying one thing but doing something else? And that is a barrier to our relationship with God, but, but maybe even worse, it can be a barrier to others receiving the gospel message. Maybe you want to invite them to church or have a, a gospel conversation, but you can't get to that point because of the hypocrisy in your life. A second question could, is this, is there lots of activity in your life, but not much fruit? In my life, there have been times I have been a hypocrite. But I tell you, it's this one here where there's lots of activity, but not much fruit that I have struggled with at different seasons of my life. Where I am busy doing things for the Lord, serving, but yet my relationship with Christ is not really growing. My relationship and the way I treat my family is not the way it should be. Lots of activity, but no real substance. And I've struggled with that, and I know that many of you do as well because you've told me that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't serve and be involved in ministry. We need all of those things, and those do help our faith. But yet, are we in prayer with God? Are we so busy doing things that we just don't, don't sit before him in God's presence? See, this is what was happening with the people of Israel. Lots of activity, hypocrisy, but they were very far from God. Now, Jesus, he gives this object lesson with this fig tree, but then he says in verses 21 and 22, he, to me, this is odd. It doesn't seem to match up. Maybe you've read this before. Uh, look at it with me again, if you will. It says, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you uh, do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. And again, it doesn't seem to match up with what is taking place here. I mean, is Jesus kind of changing topics and now going on to something else? But we need to remember the context of what is taking place. And Jesus, by referring to this mountain, I mean, what's he next to? Well, where's he been spending time? It's the temple mount. And what Jesus is saying in this context is this whole temple system, the actual temple, it's all being done away with. 
He says, you can believe that if you have enough faith. See, for Jesus' disciples to believe that, it would take a tremendous amount of faith because everything in their lives centered around the physical temple. But what Jesus is saying now, and he'll go on to develop this more with his disciples, and what Jesus is also wanting us to know is that he is replacing that physical temple, that Jesus Christ is the true temple. The temple represented God's presence with his people. Now Jesus is present with his people. But what is so amazing is Christ's spirit, the Holy Spirit, now lives in our heart. Where the Old Testament, as a covenant, had blessings and curses. Blessing if you are obedient to the law, curses if you were not. And the, the people of Israel agreed to this. But it says in Galatians of Jesus that he took the curse for us. It says in Galatians, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And now here is Christ who a few days after this event will go to the cross. He will hang on that cross. He takes the curse for our sin and our unfaithfulness. The temple is where the priests day after day, year after year would offer sacrifices over and over and over again. But now here is Jesus the once and for all sacrifice. And then also maybe one of the the sweetest parts of this is this temple area that had all these different barriers, all these different sections. You couldn't go into the, the most holy place, just the high priest once a year. And then there was a section for just the priest and then the, just the Jewish men and then just the Jewish women and then the court of the Gentiles. But Christ, through his death and resurrection, he removes all of those barriers. And what that means is that it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. You can come to Christ. That through his blood shed on the cross, you can now have direct access to God. And I know some of you, that guilt and that shame that you had is weighing you down. You're not sure if you can ever be right with God. But what Christ is telling you is that all those barriers, if you just confess your sin, it's cleansed, it's it's wiped away, it's forgotten. You can now have access and a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And what Jesus says about the temple and this temple system would come true. He He would die a few days later. He would rise from the dead. And then in AD 70, the temple and the temple system was totally destroyed. See, the physical temple was being replaced by the spiritual temple. But what is so amazing is, yes, Jesus is the temple of God, but we as God's people, the church, are also called the temple of God. And as the temple of God, as amazing as this is, it also carries with it a very weighty responsibility. And what this means through Christ's spirit, we are empowered by Christ's spirit that we need to continue to be that sanctuary for those in need, for those that need grace, that we don't put up unnecessary barriers to others coming to faith in Christ. We are all sinners. We are all in need of a savior. And so we need to continue to offer that. And I'm so thankful with our church, though we are not perfect that we do this, but we also need to remind ourselves to continue to do this because it's so easy to drift away, that we need to continue to help people find and follow Jesus. We need to continue to help people encounter Christ, that we need to be that light that points others to the beautiful person of Jesus Christ. That Jesus, this one who is gentle and lowly, but also strong and approachable. Jesus is one who is zealous and who gets angry at those that cause others to stumble, but yet so compassionate and tender to those in need. This is who our Savior is. This is who we need to continue to point others to. We need to be that light that points others to Jesus Christ. Please bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. Myself, uh, Jackie, uh, Pastor Jack, we'll be up front to help in, in any way that we can. 
I want to ask you, are there any bears in your life right now that, that are present that you need to remove so you can have a relationship with Christ? And it may be that you need to, to take that initial step of, of turning from your sin, of putting your trust in Jesus, stepping over, crossing over that line of faith and following him. But for those of us that are followers, is there, is there things right now that we just need to, to get out of our life so we can truly worship him, truly praise him? If you are ready to take that next step, and for you it may be baptism, we would love to talk with you about that. But it may be that you just need to come up front alone, come to the altar and just, just be with your father. Maybe just spill some things out before him. We'll be up front to help in any way that we can. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Lord, you are so beautiful. Lord, we, we thank you that we can see just who you are. Lord, we're also thankful, Lord, for your, your amazing compassion and Lord love for us. That you remove all those barriers, Lord, for us. Help us to take that step of following you. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We ask all in your name. Amen.